Um, so my talk tonight is on unit testing JavaScript, or as I like to say, unit tests, not just for Apex. Okay, so that's what I'm going to cover, introduction, which I'm doing now. Tools, you know, about 30 minutes on those. Uh, Visual Force, about 40 minutes. I can see you're loving this, so I'm just going to keep on. Um, lightning components, and then Q&A, which we'll probably do in the pub, because I should imagine everyone will have had enough by then. Um, so, uh, just starting off, so who here thinks unit tests are a good thing? Show of hands. And who here writes JavaScript? Show of hands. And who here writes unit tests for their JavaScript? Show of hands. <laughs> there we go. One person whose livelihood depends on it. And the reason we don't write them is because we don't have to. And I'm exactly the same. Even though I like JavaScript unit testing, typically there isn't the budget there. Customers don't often see the benefit of it. And they're like, that sounds great. We're quite happy for you to do it. You pay for it. You do it. That's awesome. We'll have the benefit. Um, so why do we write unit tests? So unit tests give us confidence. Uh, on occasions, that's misplaced confidence, that our code is perfect because our tests pass, but actually our tests were written with a complete misunderstanding of the requirements. So you must always remember your tests are, your, sorry, your code is only as good as your tests. Um, what it really helps to do is reduce the cost of bugs. So the nearer you can find a bug to a developer, the cheaper it is to fix it. Developer finds that unit testing, they just fix the code. If it's been deployed to production, that's got to be reported to the help desk because it'll be triaged. It's got to go through a whole process, got to go through loads of deployment steps, and it costs a fortune. Um, if you're writing unit tests, you tend to produce testable code. Um, if you use test-driven development, um, people who use test-driven development tend to feel they produce perfectly testable code and perfect code, and that's great. Uh, but typically, if, you think about, if you're thinking about what you need to do in order to test this, you will write code that is more testable. Um, it's, it's a good, good habit to get into, is thinking about how you're going to do this, because otherwise you're just making your next job really, really difficult for yourself. And why would you do that? Um, and it also promotes refactoring. So I think uh, anyone that's been in the industry as long as I have, which is 29 years now, um, has worked on a number of systems where there's comments in the code saying, nobody has any idea what this does, don't touch it, don't change anything. If you need to do anything, then make a call out here, put a bag on the side, and come back in again. Um, if you've got good unit test coverage, you know you can go in, you can change things, you can rerun the unit tests, you know that you haven't changed the behavior of it, you've just improved the efficiency of the code, etc. So um, if you look at a test JavaScript on Salesforce, then you've got some challenges. So you don't have a test context for your client for a start. So if you create some unit test data and insert that into the database, you've actually created data and inserted it into the database. And if as part of your unit test, you create another record and store it, then there is another record in the database. Might not be so bad in a sandbox. You can just remove that information. In a production system, you're likely to find you've kicked off downstream processing six or seven different systems. That fake customer is now receiving invoices somehow magically. Um, and you're really not uh, a very popular person. And typically, if you're using um, JavaScript, especially if you're using frameworks, there'll be some side effects. So you'll call a function, it will manipulate the DOM. It will be relying on, the, on there being some markup in the page, being able to find uh, elements with particular IDs. Um, and it will probably do some server calls as well. So, um, writing testable code on JavaScript. Um, unobtrusive JavaScript is a really good habit to get into. Because if you've striped your JavaScript across your markup, the only way to test that is to include your markup in those tests, which isn't ideal um, and pretty much impossible with Lightning components. Um, avoid anonymous functions, which I learned the hard way. About three years ago, I did a talk at Dreamforce um, on mobile applications built using JavaScript. And I think at one point in time, I found myself 11 anonymous functions down with no idea of how I got there and no idea of how I was going to get out and ended up having to rewrite it with about a week to go. So I'd certainly avoid that. And functional decomposition is really important in JavaScript as well. Typically, you want a function to decide on an action, and then another function actually takes that action, which might seem like overkill, but if you look at this function here, if I call that from a unit test with a URL that starts with a slash, um, that's going to go to the location. My unit test has then stopped because I've lost control of the browser. It's disappeared off. So ideally, what I want there is something which decides where it's going to redirect to, and I can pass it different items and check that it comes up with the right action, and then I don't have to test the action if it's going to have a, a fundamentally bad effect on my unit tests. So I produced a little demo app, which is um, a little job listing thing that allows you to search and allows you to tick the areas that you're interested in. Um, it's on GitHub as a public site, um, and there's a public test page as well. I'll post this slide deck up to the, um, the meetup group after the event. That's what I'll show in a little while. So first off, the tools. So the one, that, the one that I like to use, the unit test framework, is QUnit. So this is pure JavaScript, um, and it executes in browser. And quite a lot of the uh, JavaScript test frameworks rely on you running a local node server or something like that. 
um, which means you have to try and extract your JavaScript from Salesforce, which is fine if you've got it all in an external resource. Not so fine if you're doing things like Lightning Components, where it's all embedded in the controller and a helper. Um, and it's from the developers of jQuery. It was originally built to test jQuery, and then it was spun off as a separate project in its own right. So to use J, uh, a QUnit, all you need is to include a couple of resources, the JavaScript and the CSS, and then you have two divs. So the first div with an idea of QUnit is where your results will go, and that's what my results will look like when I execute my unit tests. And the second one is where I put any test markup that my JavaScript relies on. So if I have got some JavaScript that relies on a button with a particular ID, I can pop that in there as part of the test, and the uh, QUnit framework will clear that down in between each call. Um, so QUnit concepts, nothing particularly surprising in the testing world. You've got a module, which is a group of tests, and you can set up, have um, set up and tear down actions which are executed before and after every test. Uh, a test is a single test which gets passed an assert parameter to related to assertions and confirm particular behavior. So if you've ever written a unit test before, it's very, very familiar. So the next thing is um, sign on JS. So this is another pure JavaScript solution, um, works with any test framework. And that has three key concepts. So you have spies, which effectively allow you to wrap existing functions and gather metrics about them during your test. So how many times they've been called, what parameters they were passed, what the value of those parameters were. Um, I very rarely use those, I must admit. Stubs are really the key one for me. So that's got all the functionality of spies, but that allows me to replace individual functions in my JavaScript objects. And you've got mocks, which give you all the functionality of stubs and allow you to return expected behavior, which I don't tend to make a lot of use of. So the key thing for me is a sign-on stub. So here's an example of on my, Java, my job controller JavaScript object. I've got a do, do search function, and that's bound in through unobtrusive JavaScript to the um, search button. If I then, uh, using sign-on, create a stub, I tell it the object that I want it to stub, which is job control, and the method that I want to stub, which is do search. And what now happens is in that object, my do search has been replaced by some auto-generated sign-on stub code. So I can produce my own stub code if I want, but actually I can just tell sign on, I don't really care, just I want something that records the amount of times it's been called. So then in my, um, if I then execute job control do search, that executes the sign on stub rather than my existing code. And from that, I can then carry out assertions against this stub. So I can check in this case that it's been called once and I can verify that behavior. Um, the key thing that I also need is to retain, so I've got this.search stub. And what that allows me to do at the end of it is to restore my previous behavior, which reinstates my initial function. So obviously it's really important that my controller is left exactly as it was in between each test. I don't want anything that relies on that already being replaced because then I've got side effects in my tests. I'm gonna have a short pause before what I think is the finest thing that I've come across in JavaScript unit testing which is um, code coverage. Um, if you've, again, if you've been in the game as long as I have, where JavaScript was a way of making text turn purple, and then a couple of years later making it flash, and a couple of years later putting all those lovely functions onto a single page that like someone had been sick over it. Um, so what this allows you to do in pure JavaScript, so it runs in the browser again, um, is to generate code coverage statistics on your external JavaScript. So this works, only works with QUnit, Mocker, and Jasmine out of the box, but it does come with an API so you can create your own. Um, the only uh, requirement is that your JavaScript must be external, which typically means you can't test your Lightning Components code. So to use, Q, uh, sorry, to use um, Blanket, you just include resource Blanket JS. Then I have my um, script that contains my JavaScript controller. Um, and the key thing about this is that I've got this data cover equals true attribute, which means that um, Blanket JS will instrument my code as it loads it, which again I still think is magic, to be honest. Um, and what that does is on the QUnit, this, because this plugs into QUnit, it'll give me a little extra checkbox which allows me to enable coverage. So if I tick that, when I then run, it'll tell me for each of my resources, I've only got one here, um, it'll tell me the coverage stats, percentage coverage, and then it'll give me a global total. And I can click into that and I can actually see which lines have been covered and which lines haven't been covered. So all the stuff that you're used to if you've used code coverage tools before. So, um, real, two real places that I use this. First is Visual Force. So, um, the way I typically make it work on Visual Force is to have a dedicated test page, because I can replicate markup, I can pull my JavaScript in from static resources or Visual Force components if it's in there, um, include my JavaScript to be tested, I can capture coverage if I need to. Um, so, it's, it's, Visual Force is relatively straightforward, which I will now attempt to show. 
I'm like Todd, the bravest man in the world. I'm not going to show you very much at all in my demo. Uh, so this is my job home Visual Force page. So this is my little page that allows me to do things like pick Apex as a job that I'm interested in, click search, and it'll reduce the number of listings to those which have Apex in. So this is my um, test page. So as you can see up here, I'm including the various includes that I've already got in that main page. I've got my additional unit testing ones down here. And then in the script, I've created a module called Progress, and I've got a couple of tests on those. A few modules as I go down. Uh, I don't think I'm actually using any markup on this. So if I preview this, um, so what I get here is then the results of my unit tests. So as you can see, I've got a module called Progress, which has four, a module called Search, which has two, a module called Initialize, which has two, one of which has failed. Um, and the reason for that is because of this parameter that the developer console very handily adds on the end. I don't know why that is, something about it that uh, QUnit doesn't like. So if I remove that and hit return, then it refreshes and all my, code, my uh, tests pass, which was a big relief when I tried that on the morning of London's calling, I have to say. Um, the search doesn't work, by the way. If you put in free text search, that doesn't work. So if I ever do any demonstrations, you'll notice I just click Apex and always do that. I will fix the search at some point in time. So that's a whistle stop of Visual Force. This is all available on GitHub, so I'm not going to go through the code in any great detail. Anyone who's interested to that degree, I'm sure, will put themselves through that misery on their own time. Um, so the next thing is Lightning Components. Lightning Components do present a bit of a challenge, um, because unlike Visual Force, where you're typically pulling it in from a resource or maybe a, a Visual Force component, your components are isolated from each other. Your JavaScript lives in the controller and helper, and you can't really do very much to extract that unless you, you could put all your... JavaScript into a, a, an external resource, but it'd be quite hard to debug. You wouldn't have any of the, um, the Lightning component framework uh, benefits. Um, you can't capture coverage um, because you don't control how your JavaScript is included, or at least I haven't found a way to. Given that Blanket has an API, there probably is a way to do it, but I haven't invested that much time in it. And also your markup is fixed. So if I put in some things about QUnit, next time I deploy that component anywhere, they get some lovely QUnit markup in there as well, unless I have some hideous things around passing attributes, which um, set display to none and all that kind of thing. Um, and then the other thing is, how do you trigger the test? How do you make this happen? So there's probably a number of ways of doing this, but this is the, the method that I've come up with. So I put my QUnit test in a helper function with a controller method that executes it. So there's an example of one of my helper functions. Creates a QUnit module and then executes three tests with a bit of try-catch around it. And I have a Lightning application that contains um, uh, other comp these components that I want to test. So they're sitting inside of my application, but I'm not really displaying any data. I don't really care about what they're going to do. Um, then I have uh, my tests are executed basically by an event. So in, this comes from the initialization function of my Lightning test application. That fires a run test event. And that, that's an application event, which means that basically any component that I've included in my page that can handle that application event can then execute its unit tests, the results of which go off to QUnit, which is quite nice. So there's an aura handler there, gets the event of run test event, the action that it executes is C, C controller run tests, and that effectively executes those tests, and that will happen for every component on the page, which is actually quite nice. So I'm going to have a go at demoing that as well. So here's my, it's going to look very similar, but here's my, um, this is a Lightning Components version of exactly the same page, exactly the same, the search doesn't work, but the, uh, the checkboxes do, so nothing if not consistent. Uh, and then I have my job test app, so if we look at this, what this does is this pulls in all my various unit test um, uh, resources, so key unit sign on, uh, it doesn't pull in blanket because that doesn't really work. Um, and then. The, uh, the bit that pulls in the components that I'm going to test, I've got that styled as display none, mainly because QUnit and other styling, other frameworks don't really play very nicely together and it all just looks a bit messy. So I just hide away those components. But each of those components is basically able to handle a run test event, which I have said that I'm going to fire. And that happens as part of my after scripts loaded event. So if I go to my, if I've got my job test app, if I hit the update preview there, and that's basically pulled in two Lightning components, executed unit tests on them, and generated the results in such a way that it's relatively unobtrusive if I give those Lightning components to somebody else. 
who needs to use them on a page, they won't have any of my, the only thing they've got to deal with is there is a little bit of bloatware of my, my additional testing code, but there's no markup, there's nothing they have to do to get it be, to behave differently um, in order for their requirements. Back to that one again because it was so good. Um, so you're pleased to know this is the last slide. Um, so takeaways um, when I was playing around with this. So basically unobtrusive JavaScript. You really have to do that in Lightning anyway, but it's a good practice to get into in Visual Force as well, just because it makes life so much easier when you start hitting any kind of problems. Um, functional decomposition is the absolute key because it turns out that I haven't actually been very good at doing this. So I've got quite a lot of stuff I'm having to refactor in order to test it. Um, and avoid anonymous functions because, yeah, it's, they're a great idea for a while and they do have their place but they're not a solution to everything. Um, and remember that you haven't got a client-side test context, so stubs are your best friend. Stubs stop anything happening, going back to the server, doing any damage. Um, and that is me. And I will happily take any questions, um, probably in the pub. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time, everybody.